All right, thank you so much for staying with us. We carry on with uh, To The Point. Our conversation tonight, of course, being alcoholism with my panelist, Reverend Dr. Stephen Mairori, who is the NACADA board chairman, Kevin Carey, the petitioner to have alcoholism declared a national disease in Kenya. Mr. Chris Paskimaru, who is an addiction counselor and a recovering alcoholic. And of course, Professor Seth Oket shall join us later on. He is the chairman, APRAC, that is Addiction Prevention and Rehabilitation Association of Kenya. I am asking for your feedback. I see it. Justin Tina says they should declare it a national disaster. But at its brevian says so many disasters to be dealt with. That's, it. That's what he says. Okay, okay. We welcome all the you know feedback and stuff. Thank you. Thank you so much. Keep it coming, okay? Let's carry on with uh, to the point and now take a look at the effects of alcohol. Now there are about 230 different types of diseases where alcohol has a significant role. That is according to the Global Status Report on Alcohol and and Health 2018 by WHO. And I think Chris Pass did mention that earlier on, right? Let's take a look at some of them. So among the diseases, according to Center for Disease Control and Prevention is high blood pressure, heart disease, stroke, liver disease. I remember that from primary, liver cirrhosis, and digestive problem, cancer of the breast, mouth, throat, esophagus, voice box, liver, colon, and rectum. So for this one, I will have Mr. Chris Pass react to this. Uh, you shall share your story with us, though already from your title, you know, we know addiction counselor and recovering alcoholic. We shall get to your story, sir. But this is not personal, okay? Yeah. But I just want to ask, for those 17 years, yeah, yeah. were you aware of, of any of this, the effects? I, I had an idea. You that, did? Uh, what what kind of idea? That uh, I had digestive problems, I had gastritis, I had a lot of pain uh, because of the gastritis. I knew I, I was basically dying inside. Eh? And uh, of course, also my, my, my brain wasn't functioning properly because from a graduate to sleeping in the streets and borrowing money from everyone, I knew there was a, uh, there was a problem, a, a big problem. But I wasn't able to get out of it because uh, like I said, I was dealing with uh, uh, a mental health issue here, mm -hmm. uh, the, the alcohol use disorder. So uh, I, if you go to a bar, by the way, you'll find people who know about all these risks, but already they are struggling with something that has taken hold of um, the, the, the brain reward system. So you wake up saying, I'll, ne I'll not drink, I don't want to drink, but you find yourself compelled uh, to have a drink. So we, we have an idea about all these. We have an idea about, um, in, in fact, most of the uh, patients I interact with in the, in the rehab also, now who are in addiction, they, they have doctor's assessment, they have doctor's results, they have gone to so many hospitals. They know about all these issues, but now they are struggling. They are not in control anymore. That's why they have to go in the morning uh, at 4 a.m., go knock uh, uh, in a bar, for them to have a drink. Mm -hmm. They no longer have control. And that's, that, that's what uh, distinguishes between alcohol use, no more alcohol use, and alcoholism. alcoholism. Yeah. So this is what I was suffering from. Right. I know you're wondering why I was not looking at you. I was on my phone yeah. looking for something you posted earlier today, five, five hours ago. You said, um, not you, though, it's, it's just a post, it's a photo here that says, behind every hangover, there's a promise of never drinking again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, share, I, I yes, shared that. Yeah. Yes, in, in the morning, um, you see, when you drink, maybe you go home at 10 or 11, in the morning by 2 a.m., 3 a.m., you are awake. The alcohol effect is, is gone. And that's when now you're facing the reality that I had a phone. Uh, for me, for those 17 years, most of those years, I didn't know how I went, I got uh, to the house. So the first thing I would do was, first of all, to check where I was, you know, check whether I have walls, I check whether there is uh, anyone in, in bed, for me to know where I was. Eh? Uh, then uh, at that moment, I would start thinking about the decisions I had made. I didn't have a phone, my phone was gone, check whether I have any dents, it was, it was a bad situation. Mm -hmm. um, of course, the first thing I would swear was, I'll never drink again, but that is at 3 a.m. By 4 a.m., I'm thinking about so many failures in my life, the job I had at Safaricom that I lost, the job at TSC, the child I'm not seeing, uh, the, the, the parents I've, I've, I've lied to, my, my siblings I've lied to over and over, so many things that uh, at the end of, by, by 4.30, I would just find myself going out of the house to look for a drink to calm me down. 
mm-hmm. you see, and mm-hmm. that the cycle would repeat itself. Mm-hmm. Whether or if I had, a, of course, I, because I didn't have money, I would look for, for anything to sell. Mm-hmm. If it's a, a cup or a bottle, anything that I would sell mm-hmm. in the morning. And, and that's why if you go to central Kenya in the morning, you'll find most, uh, most uh, people going to the bar, they have something they are carrying. Mm-hmm. It could be your mother's sufuria. It could be even uh, be your child. I remember one time I carried my child's uh, you know, n- new clothes that had been uh, donated. You know, when you have a child and um, uh, people come visit. So this, this was like a suit, a, a nice suit that had not been opened. So I carried it because they, it was the only way for me to get a drink. No. Oh, yes. At one time, my wife used to hide money uh, in the baby, inside the baby, because she thought that's the only place I could not find money. But I, I had kind of... Anyway. Yes, <laughs> like I could money. smell money. Smell money. <laughs> I, would, I would check the house, scan the house, check, and I would say, she can't hide that money there. And I'll see the baby and like, mm. oh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the baby wouldn't talk. It was just a baby, but I would hold the baby and... I would get that money. Mm. That's how bad the situation yeah. is. Yeah. But at that point, you're at the last stage of uh, you know, uh, alcohol use, yeah. the compulsive stage, where you don't think about anything else. Right. You don't think about the consequences. Right. You can, I, uh, so many times I killed my parents. You, know, you, mm. you mm. call people uh, you, use, you are in college with, you tell them your mm. parent is dead. Oh, we, 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 uh, you know, they're in hospital. We, we are fundraising. Mm. You know. And then after, because you are high, after two weeks, you still call them and tell them your, your mom is in hospital now. And they'll be like, but Chris, you told me your, your mom, mom is dead. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. not adding up. Yeah? OK, uh, Mr. Yeah. Inonda, he's my director. He says, you are subuhi that morning. You now start looking at the ingredients of ikitu, mm. uh, the bottle and, and what was what that you took last night. Yeah. OK, let's, let's move on. And uh, alcohol, actually. Alcoholism does cause harm to the well-being and health of people around the drink. And I think we've gotten that thus far from the conversation we've been having. So let's now come home to Kenya and talk matters Nakada, which is a gazette, uh, it was... um, a Gazette notice, rather, dated April 26, 2001, established the National Agency for the Campaign Against Drug Abuse, that is NACADA, to undertake public education and awareness campaign against drug abuse, especially among youth in schools and other institutions. Now, according to NACADA, they have thus far accredited 100 rehabilitation centers. They've put about 2,130 illicit brew and saved the lives of 8,000 people. Let's move on and talk now. Numbers now. And uh, first things first, alcohol is the most abused drug in Kenya. That's not according to me, but a survey but by the National Authority for the Campaign Against Alcohol and Drug Abuse, that is NACADA, which showed that, listen to this, one in every eight Kenyans, one in every eight Kenyans, aged 15 to 65 years, that's a population of about 3 million people, mm. are currently using alcohol. Now, one in every five males aged 15 to 65 years that is about 2.5 million and okay I know tonight we have an all male panel okay but this is not just a men's or a male thing it affects women too so listen to this one in every 20 females that is about 687,000 are using alcohol okay one in 20 Kenyans aged 15 to 65 are addicted to alcohol, accounting for about 1.4 million people. And seven years is the minimum age of initiation into alcohol use in Kenya. 23.8% of the public sector workers were using or abusing alcohol in 2021. I don't know where to start. Maybe start from the inception. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. Yes. Because you find, according to that statistics, majority of people are now introduced to alcoholism, either mostly for men, for male, during their initiation. Because you find now, as, as we now go back to the cultural aspect of it, you find that uh, as a way of maybe the person who was uh, taking care of you wants now to introduce you to, to vices. They say vices are what were mm-hmm. So one of those vices maybe is now alcoholism alcohol intake. So you find that either you are induced at that stage, if you are able to succeed at that stage, again at your high school education, you will find one or two 
senior students ahead of you. Either they are, they are facing this challenge and they want now to introduce more people into that. So that now they're not alone. So if, you, if you're able to, again to succeed at that stage, again now maybe in the, in the tertiary level, that's not, maybe that's now where it now becomes rampant because most of the time you find now people are now away from their parents. Yeah. You're now either living, either you're now, you've now been called to Nairobi to study or another place far away from home. Mm -hmm. You're now at, at are now are not, not under the wings of your parents. So you're able now to make decisions for your own. So even if you drink, you say that no one will know. So again, if you're able to succeed, I think now you're able now to cross over right, successfully. Right. Yeah. Okay, we're yes. due for a break in, what, two minutes? I thought it was three minutes. And I'm going to engage you on this, Dr. Stephen, because even more devastating is the numbers in schools. Listen to this, 2.6% of primary school pupils use or abuse alcohol. 3.8% of secondary school students use or abuse alcohol. 82,517 secondary school students were abusing alcohol in 2022. Now I give this a rough estimate of 9.3% of the students going by mild calculations because in 2022, the KCAC candidates were 881,416. So the 9.3% of this is this. Mm -hmm. My goodness. I mean, I'm tongue tied. This conversation, this is devastating, sir. It's a very sorry state. And uh, I'd like to probably looking at these numbers, huh? you think about parenting. Something has gone wrong that we probably need to be talking more about. Because when a student goes to school, primary school, you talk of 2.6. Eh? Those are people still under the control of parents. Eh? So you have a parent and a teacher. But you also have a community. You know, when we grew up, if somebody got me misbehaving, <laughs> they took care of me. <laughs> you know, they would say, this is wrong, this is not right. But there's something wrong in the society. And as we had rightfully said, uh, alcohol is being glorified in most of our societies. And that's why when small children see, then they think it's the right thing. And uh, you would imagine uh, when a child comes home and both parents are drunk or they're drinking, then they think it's a normal mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. and, but so, let me just yes. interject. The question would yes. be, and I'm asking this in your capacity as yes. board chair, yes. uh, as chairperson Nakada, I mean, there's so many liquor joints that are mushrooming everywhere. Mm. I mean, our estates, <coughs> upper, there's a house, mm. next door, kuna bar, mm. upper pengine kuna do some mm. spirit joint and something. I mean, why is this in your capacity yes. as chair and Akade? Uh, Grace, this is something we are addressing right now because I think we had a major legal problem in the country. Uh, and this is, I will talk about it more because I think that is where it's one of the roots of our problems. Yeah. The 2010 constitution, Mm. transfer the powers of licensing to the counties. Mm. So when the counties were given uh, the power to license, they went for revenue. And so anybody applying for a bar and all that, they never did the due diligence. And so bars were licensed everywhere. Mm -hmm. When Nakada was having the licensing thing, the DCs by then, you know, the government officers made sure that the number of bars were very few. And there was a very clear process. So we've engaged the governors now. We're actually in very serious conversation. The deputy president has come in, and we are trying to deal with that issue. The law is very clear on the distance a bar should be from a school, mm -hmm. from worship places. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, you, you, the police go and they find somebody has a legitimate license eh, from a county. And so it becomes a talk of where the, guy, the person goes to the courts and all that. But we'll discuss more about this because this is really where one of the biggest yeah. problems. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. All right, so we are due for a break, a very short break. Let's take that break. Stay with us.